Jerry. Thank you, Jerry. Let's do our memory verse together. Psalm 121, 5 and 6. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade on your right hand. The sun will not smite you by day, nor the moon by night. Psalm 121, 5 and 6. Okay, we'll let our kids go to Children's Church and uh, teachers with them, I hope. <laughs> talking to my wife and said, I remember very clearly as a kid that Labor Day was when you started school and now the kids have three weeks of school behind them before they ever hit Labor Day and it's absolutely amazing. Let's pray together. Ed Johnson, would you lead us in prayer? Amen. You may be seated. You know, I, I think about how glad I am that I live in the time that I live and where I live. And here's what I mean. Do you realize if you lived 200 years ago, nearly every convenience you have did not exist? You think of the cell phone that you have? Didn't exist. Microwave you have? Didn't exist. The air conditioner you have didn't exist. The heating system you have didn't exist. The hot water coming out of the shower didn't exist. The list goes on. The automobile that you drove to get here didn't exist. The, if you like me, the surgery that you had wouldn't have happened. The medication that you take didn't exist. I get to looking at, I am so glad I live now. The food that I had this morning, I wouldn't have been able to get because you couldn't have brought it that far and still had to be good, et cetera, et cetera. I am so glad that I live now. I am grateful. And I'm grateful I live where I live. We complain about the illegal immigrants. You know why they're here? Because this is one of the best places in the world to live. And they will risk going across the desert in the most severe heat with a guide having paid maybe a thousand dollars all they have. Some of them will send their children because they, it's the only hope those kids have. There are people who will fly from the Middle East to South America to Mexico and try to sneak in to this country that I was born in and I get to live here. And what do we do as Americans? We complain. We gripe about our government, about everything else. You know what it reminds me of? The children of Israel. God takes them out of Egypt, they get out and they begin immediately to complain. What do they complain about? the food, the leaders. Ooh, that sounds like me. So many times, we should be so grateful. And I'm gonna bring one more to you this morning. I looked at this and thought, man, am I ever fortunate. We've been rumbling around in the book of Romans. We're in Romans eight, and it's now versus then. This is what I mean by that. Romans 8:18 8, says this, "For I consider that the suffering of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed to us." The suffering that I now go through. Now who wrote that? This guy named the Apostle Paul. 
we elevated him up there to how great he was and all of those things. But have you ever thought about what his conversion meant and what my conversion meant, well, how different those two were? Here's what I mean. Before Paul's converted, he's a Jew. Matter of fact, he says in Philippians 3, he's talking about his life. And he says, circumcised the eighth day of the nation of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness, which is in the law, found blameless. Meaning that when he started out, he had everything going his way. He says, I'm a Jew, which means I'm one of God's chosen people. And there are all those Gentiles out there, and they're not. I'm circumcised. I'm following. On the eighth day, that happens. He says, then I'm of the nation of Israel. That's that thing that, like he said, he's of the tribe of Benjamin. He can look back and go, one of my ancestors was king of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin. And then goes back a little further and he says, when you look at the Jewish law, this reason is capitalized, first five books of the law, he says, man, let me tell you, I'm a Pharisee. Matter of fact, another place he says, I was a Pharisee, son of a Pharisee. Now, Pharisees were the most respected group there was. I did a wedding yesterday, a, a Filipino wedding. It was a lot of fun because they're very different. And, um, and so they uh, have all the stuff, but part of them were uh, Baptists and part of them were Catholics. And so they referred to me as father. Man, do I get to be cool, right? Because the priests were respected. The Pharisees aren't priests, but they are respected. They're the, the class. They wore robes that set them apart, that showed, I am following all the rules, and I follow them better than anybody else. I've got more bumper stickers on the back of my robe than anybody else. I am very, very spiritual. And he's in that top elite group. And then he says, as to zeal, he is on top. One of the other places he tells us in the scriptures that his zeal, he is rising above those that are in the same class that he's in. He's out persecuting chasing the church. As to righteousness that you find in the law, he said, you would have found me to be blameless. If you as a human were looking at me, you couldn't have found anything wrong with me. He's learned under Gamaliel. That's one of the top guys. It's like if I said, and I learned to preach under Billy Graham. You'd all go, oh, wow. You see, and he's under Gamaliel. He is on top and then he meets Jesus, and everything changes. He now is on the bottom. I got to thinking about that. That's, that's crazy. Matter of fact, he goes to 2 Corinthians, and I didn't put it all up there, so you'll actually have to look at your Bibles or your iPads or whatever you got with you this morning. And this is what he says. Are they servants of Christ? I speak as if insane. I more so. In far more labors, far more imprisonments, beaten times without numbers, often in dangers of death, five times I received from the Jews 39 lashes, three times I was beaten with rods, once I was stoned, three times I was shipwrecked, a night and day I have spent in the deep, I've been on frequent journeys, in dangers from rivers, Dangers from robbers, dangers from my countrymen, dangers from the Gentiles, dangers in the city, dangers in the wilderness, dangers on the sea, and dangers among false brethren. I have been in labor and hardship, through many sleepless nights, in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure. Wow, what a deal. 
before he becomes a Christian, he's got it on easy street. He then gives his life to Jesus Christ, and everything goes to pieces. He gets beaten, he goes through all those things, and he experienced all of that. Now that sounds, if I got up and preached that, what would happen in America today? Would people say, I want that. When we get up and preach, we preach, and when you give your life to Jesus, things will get better. You're not going to have the problems you had before. He's going to take care of you. Everything's going to get good. But that's not what happened. And the United States is one of the few places you can actually preach that gospel and get away with it. Because if you go to China and preach that, they look at you and go, are you kidding me? That's not what happens. Now I can go to jail because I've just become a Christian. You go to the Middle East and preach that gospel? You won't go there either. And the Apostle Paul says, what's happened to him is a lot of suffering. He's gone through hard times because he's become a Christian. But back to where we were in Romans. He says there, For I consider the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared to the glory that is to be revealed to us. But you notice those first two words, three words, for I consider. The word is to, to reckon, to calculate, to compute in the Greek. It means you got to sit down and think through that. I think about the times when Paul was in prison and all that stuff. That wasn't fun. He didn't say, man, I can just hardly wait. I hope they throw me in prison again. And he's not out looking to get thrown in prison. He's not one of those people that does that. But he looks and he says, you know, all the suffering that I go through, he said, when I sit down and calculate it, it is not even worth being compared to what eternity is going to be like on the good end. You know what that means eternity is going to be like? Man, is it going to be something. I don't know what it's like. People have, you know, I've gone to heaven and came back. But then you have a lot of stories. Who knows, true or not true? The Apostle Paul says, you know what? When I go to heaven, all of these things are not even going to matter. It is going to be so small. If you were to put them in a balance and say, here's my suffering, and here's eternity, and what's going to happen, the glory, it's going to go like that. Okay, but I'm not suffering. So how do I apply this verse to my life? I'm not, I'm not suffering. My wife is a little bit, but I'm not Okay, I'm, I'm in, I look at this and I drive a nice car. I get a, what about suffering? What? And then I look around. I was with somebody this week in the hospital and uh, he was talking to me. He says, you know, the longer I live, the less I want to be here. He said, you know, I am looking forward to going home. I got some real good things to look forward to. And then I got to think about people who do go through suffering. Now, what Paul's talking about here is, of course, because of his faith in Jesus Christ. And that's the overt thing where Satan has attacked him over and over again. He's suffering because of that. But you know, Satan not only works overtly, he also works subvertly, where you just, behind the scenes, you don't even see it. There was this guy in the Old Testament he worked all the time. And because he worked all the time, they gave him the name of Job. Oh. Job, maybe, you know him as. But you notice how Satan got to him? He didn't get a bunch of people to come and attack him because he was the most godly man on the face of the earth, according to God. He got him in his family. He got him in his work, he got him in his wealth, and he got him in his health. And let me tell you, Satan can still do that. I look at some people and I wonder, why do they go through the health issues they go through? And how?
how in the world can they maintain their faith in Jesus Christ? You know, I look at it, and they have one health thing after the other, after the other. I look at Marie, Tony, and I look at and I go, how can she go through that? I think of Nancy Abreu, who went through, I, don't, I told her they might as well just put a zipper on her because she had had so many surgeries. And her skin got so thin that I, I don't even know how they kept it together and those kinds of things. How do they keep drawing close to Christ? And how do they keep doing that? And then I look at some people and they get, and I'm not talking because of their own bad spending habits, but it's financial crisis happens in their lives and it just happens to them. And they go through suffering because of that. And then I, I think of people with their kids. You raise them as best you can and they cause you nothing but grief and heartache and broke. And man, there is suffering. Maybe I should have done this. Maybe I could have done that. Whatever. Then there are those who lose a child. One of the most devastating things in the world. And the pain does not go away. Maybe it gets a little softer with time, but it never leaves. And they're part of that club that they don't want to be part of. And there's that kind of suffering. So what do you do when you do that? You know, how do we go through suffering? Like I said, fortunately, I've, I've missed tons of that stuff. So what do we do? How do we face it? Paul writing in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 17 says this, For momentary light affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison. So essentially, that's the same thing. A little bit different. He says, number one, it's momentary and it's light. I look at Paul's suffering and I say, that doesn't sound all that momentary or light to me. But that's the way he viewed it. This is momentary. How many of us, you know, you've, you've gotten older like I have. I've reached that thing where I'm two-thirds of a century old. And I go, man, how did some of that get by me? I mean, trying to remember back into when I was in my 50s and that kind of stuff. And, and I was, Frankie and I were talking about, you know, our kids when they were little and all, and man, that seemed like a long time ago, but boy, it got by quickly. This is momentary. I get to looking at it. I've uh, done a couple of funerals lately as well, and I did one, and then I got to thinking. I did my uncle's funeral. He was 99 and nine months, three months short of 100. But you put that in the time span of everything, and it's not much. I remember him, one quick story. He was on crutches when he was in his 80s. I said to Uncle Fred, what, how did you do that? And he says, well, I was showing my great grandkids this knife trick and I slipped and fell. He said, the grass was wet when I was doing it. You know? And I think, but yet that's been gone. I don't know how many years ago my Uncle Fred passed away. Probably 20. But it seems like yesterday. It is momentary. And it is light compared to what glory is going to be like. But the word that's, that I found fascinating is the word producing. And it, in the Greek, it's a prefix and another word. And it means to work out. That is... When the suffering begins, what it should work out in me is drawing me closer to Jesus Christ. That's what should be happening. When you begin to suffer, one of two things will happen. You will draw closer to Christ or you will leave him and go away from him. And what it's saying here is when we go into suffering, we have the option of having that produce something that will have eternal value. It should drive me to Christ himself. So that when we do go through the suffering, and all of us go through it one way or the other. I mean, I think back when 
our son was getting ready to graduate from college and I had my little bicycle accident. I was supposed to leave the next day, but i am been care flighted to Washoe Med, and my wife comes in and I can still see the fear on her face and the concern and all those things. And I caused that. You know, that was a time of suffering for her. And I had looked up at her and said, you can't do anything for me. You go to his graduation. It's in Indiana. And she was had to fly, and you go represent us. And at that point, it was I knew I had to trust God to take care of her, because everything changed at that point. She was going to have to drive. She was going to have to do all those things. There were some other people that were going to go from our church. She was going to have to pick them up. She got to take care of them, all that stuff. And I was causing her to go through that grief and that suffering. Not intentionally, but that's what happened. And so what happens, we will go through times of grief. We will go through times of suffering when we go, what is going on here? Maybe a child becoming sick. And I looked out and saw Renee, and I thought what she went through with her son. You know, just all of that stuff that she had to go through. Is he ever going to grow up? Is he ever going to make it? The long hours, all of that. I think of Jean with her health. You know, the input that it puts on Ernie, etc. We go through those times. We just don't recognize them half the time. Sometimes it's just part of life. Sometimes it is Satan saying, I'm going to do what I can do to destroy your walk with Jesus Christ. And I will do what I can to separate you from him. You give your life to Jesus, you may pay for it and never know it. I think of people who have lost their families, not because of death, but when they gave their life to Jesus, their family wrote them off. And the suffering doesn't go away. And I think about other countries and other places where you, in fact, do lose your family. I mean, they'll take them away from you. So what do you do? If you were faced with that, I think about that. One of the reasons I hand out that church around the world is because people do suffer because they serve Jesus Christ. You know, we don't know in this country right now. And when I gave my life to Christ, Back when I was in the Navy in Iceland, they didn't say to me, if you become a Christian, we're going to demote you and you can no longer work on these airplanes and da-da-da-da-da-da. They didn't do that to me. They didn't do any of that. Got mocked a little bit. Big deal. You know? But some people, because they give their life to Jesus, they suffer. Serious consequences. We need to be praying for them. That's the number one thing we can do. Number two, when you and I go through suffering, we need to know these verses to say, Lord, right now I'm suffering and it's hurting. But I know one thing. What waits for me in eternity is worth a whole lot more than anything I will ever go through here. Two, when we tell people about Jesus Christ and this is how you become a Christian we need to put in oh and by the way things may go badly for you if you give your life to Jesus that's the honest truth you look at 1 Peter you look at 2 Peter you look at those things and it says constantly there is the possibility of suffering matter of fact there was a Danish philosopher a theologian named Soren Kierkegaard and Kierkegaard used to say, if you're not suffering, you're not walking with Jesus. That's not true. That's the opposite. We always have to get out on the extremes. Some people will, some people won't. Paul gets run out of town, gets thumped on and everything else. Timothy stays. Okay. We may have to go through suffering. Maybe our government will change, and it will make a difference whether or not we receive Christ. But we need to tell people suffering can be part of the Christian faith. Whether we realize it, whether we want it, 
or not. And then I think the very last thing is we need to prepare ourselves. Lord, if suffering comes, may it work eternal glory. May I draw closer to Jesus. May it produce something better in me. I think back with Nancy. I'll use her. She's not here. They moved to Montana. There must be something about Montana this morning. But I can't tell you the number of people she shared Christ with in the hospital. And then she would, when she would talk to people when she was out saying, isn't this amazing what God has done with my life? Doesn't mean she didn't struggle with it. She didn't go, oh boy, I'm going to have another surgery. I'm just so looking forward to it. No, she didn't like that. But that was part of her life. And God used it to bring an eternal weight of glory in her life. So maybe some suffering that you're going through right now. Maybe with your children. Maybe financially. Maybe physically. Maybe who knows what. What will it produce in your life? That's the question we need to ask ourselves. For momentary light affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison. So when we get to this stage, hopefully we can say with the Apostle Paul, for I consider, that means I sat and I calculated, it's not going to be your first response that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy compared to the glory that is to be revealed to us. Some glad day, I will step out into eternity. I look and I think, you know, if I live 20 more years, I'll be 87. My mom was 85 when she died. My dad was 92. It's halfway in between. So what are the next 20 years going to be? Who knows? I don't. But when I gave my life to Jesus Christ, he does. And he will take me through all of it. If he told me back then, Jerry, you will no longer be doing electronics. You won't get to do what you want to do. You'll be pastoring this renegade bunch of people in the middle of nowhere. Would I have said yes? Well, I certainly hope so. Because truthfully, Frank and I were talking about this too. I've had it very easy pastoring this church. You guys have been great and easy to pastor. Compared to what I see other pastors go through, I'm grateful to God. But the last thing is, stop complaining. We complain so easily. We have it so good. We complain about Washington, Carson City, everybody, everything. And we're the rich kids. We're the kids that have it good. We're the rich kids of the world. You know, we hear the billionaires complain, well, I had to take a cut in salary. I only got two and a half million dollars this week. We go, that is the most, you know how God must sometimes feel about us? I am the richest kid in the world. I have Jesus Christ. I am going to spend eternity with God because of that. And I get to live in this country, one of the best countries in the world, and I was born here. I don't deserve it. I just got it. Lord, help me not to be a whiner and a complainer. I am not even suffering. I have brothers and sisters around the world who would trade me in a heartbeat. Then I have the lost who do not know Jesus. And if they knew what waited for them in eternity, I'll guarantee you they would trade me in a heartbeat. We have the good news to take out this suffering that you go through now compared to what eternity is like 
is nothing, even though it seems huge today. Let's pray.